We will rock you, and you know soil does come from rocks, which are deposited um, and uh, through the sedimentary process of, um, of sand and soil and uh, organic matter being compressed over time. Um, and then through weathering, those rocks break down and form soil and sand and uh, different things that we'll be looking at here. So welcome to another subdiscipline of forensics, which breaks out into fascinating science in other realms. So um, there are several things that affect the soil, which can be used in, as forensic evidence. Uh, the temperature, rainfall, chemicals, minerals. And um, there are a variation of physical and chemical characteristics of soil that vary by the geography, which is imperative in being able to help to perhaps identify um, where a body had been um, let's say, killed and then moved to another place if the soil does not match the type of soil found where the body is, and so forth. So again, uh, suspects to crime scenes, like if the soil is on their shoes and it's a particular type of soil found at the scene, and location of burial sites. So um, coming from 1893, Dr. Hans Gross was the first to uh, recognize the importance of physical evidence in general, rather than just eyewitness testimony, um, or motive, but actually having science back up um, a conviction. And then uh, George Pop first used soil evidence to solve a crime and um, linked soil samples found um, on a suspect with those found at the scene. So the composition of soil um, can be evaluated based on its mineral content which on average, and of course, you know, this is an average of soils that, that do differ. Um, the average is about 45% of content by volume being minerals. This would include calcium and phosphorus and, um, you know, different, different things that when you look at your ingredients on your vitamins, you see a lot of these things. Um, there is also um, about 20 to 30% within the pore space of soil constituting air. 20-30% water, and then just about 5% being organic matter, things that come from other living things. So the texture of soil can be categorized by three sizes. The largest of the three is actually sand grains, um, and then the medium size would be silt, and the smallest would be clay, very fine particles. Three subcategories of soil types would include loam, and loam is a fertile soil. It's roughly um, equal in proportion in its sand, silt, and clay contents. Peat is a boggy substance that um, is acidic and partly um, composed of decomposing uh, plant and vegetation matter. And it's often harvested for gardening and also as a fuel. And then chalk, chalky soil, is, uh, is a soft white limestone, um, which is a calcium carbonate. And it's from skeletal remains of sea creatures. So in thinking about the different sizes of soil grains as well as the different components, um, there can be a soil profile which can be analyzed using a cross section of that soil. So the humus, uh, which is the top layer, is an organic component of soil. And this is formed by um, the decomposition of leaves, other plant matter, and this happens at the work of soil microorganisms. So that makes up this, this top um, humus layer. The A layer here uh, is the topsoil, which is a mi mixture of the humus and other minerals. E makes up the sand and silt, followed by B, which is the subsoil, clay and minerals. C, which is um, the broken rock, which is obviously decreasing in the amount of organic matter um, because you're getting further away from photosynthetic life forms that live on the top. And then R is the solid rock layer. So we need to look at the chemistry of the soil as part of our investigation to see if uh, the soil that is on suspect A's boots matches the soil chemistry uh, from the soil found at the scene. So one way of doing that is measuring the pH, which is either the acidity, whether if it's a um, low pH value, or the basticity of a high pH value, just to give you um, some examples of where the pH scale um, hits with, with certain things. Battery acid is a one, very acidic. Um, two and a half, 
lemon juice. Uh, rain, which is not acid rain, is slightly acidic at 5.5. Milk is 6.5. 7 is, of course, pure water, uh, perfectly neutral. And then um, a couple of examples for basic things would be detergents would be about 10. Uh, drain cleaner, 13 and a half. By the way, if you have a septic tank, don't pour drain cleaner down your drain. It kills the microorganisms in your septic tank, which break down the matter that you put in your septic tank. Okay, so again, um, there are part of the soil profile involves the uh, pH, but there are several things that can affect the pH. Um, so, first of all, the things that make up the soil, but also rainfall, um, especially if it's um, a type of polluted, like acidic rain, then that would generally cause the pH of that soil to become more acidic. Um, other pollutants that are basic in nature could influence it in the other direction, and usually fertilizer, like ammonium fertilizer, um, is going to cause the soil to become more acidic as well. So the pH can be used to help match um, samples or show that they don't match. So the way that um, that rock is broken down into sand is either usually by wind or water. Now wind is more effective at this because um, it causes other sand particles to hit those rocks. And so if you can think about what's more effective to sand something down, sandpaper or water, the sandpaper is going to be more effective. Now, water will have a weathering or, or um, deterioration effect on rock, but it's just a slower process. By the way, this was once a full uh, rock formation, which through weathering has become this beautiful arch that you see here. So the mineral composition of sand can also be analyzed. Um, sand can contain maybe just one mineral in which it's called a crystal sand or um, it can be composed of many minerals, one of which would be quartz, which gives it this really light color. Um, and then um, sand or mineral composition um, in sand can also be affected, um, the sand can also be affected by, in terms of shape, um, once again by weathering as well as and, uh, by its mineral composition. So certain minerals would stand up um, more, with more endurance um, amidst weathering than others. For example, feldspar is kind of a softer mineral which might degrade faster than something harder like quartz. So the rounded sand, like you see here, um, might show evidence of um, being in a more highly windy or water, um, moving water kind of environment, whereas the angular can show um, less weathering and or minerals that are uh, more strong to endure that. So here's a, a picture of that feldspar that I mentioned earlier. We saw a picture of quartz. Mica can also be in the sand um, and iron compounds. Sand can also contain organic matter, such as coral or seashells. I don't know about you, but I'd like to zap myself right here to this volcanic Hawaiian beach. It is striking. We're used to beaches that look like this, containing quartz. But this is a volcanic sand, which includes black basalt or green olivine, and so it forms this dark color. So the point being that sand varies so drastically throughout the planet, as soil does as well. And um, so it's reminding me of a story that I read about um, tracking down these, um, these uh, basically bombs that were um, shipped from Japan to the United States uh, during the World War era and um, through the ballasts that were used to try to regulate the flight of these uh, air balloons across the ocean, the sand was evaluated and scientists were actually able to say not only do we know these are from Japan but based on the sand we know it was from this particular beach in Japan and that's how much that soil can tell us about location. So um, also um, in categorizing the sand types, uh, we can look at what makes it up in terms of being a biogenic or skeletal sand from broken shells, things that were once living, as well as a precipitate sand, um, which would be composed of something like calcium carbonate from um, the egg shape or round spheres of calcium carbonate coming from the rock. So this would be more of a biological origin and this would be more of a geological origin. 
And um, one thing that's interesting is that the skeletal sand, because it's made of these once living organisms, will emit bubbles when it reacts with acid. And I remember being in a geology class and had a test and I had all these minerals laid out in front of me. And one of the tools I had was a little dropper bottle of acid. So um, I definitely knew that if I dropped the acid on the, the skeletal sand, um, then it was going to bubble. So I like wanted to do that for every single test, but it only helps to identify one type. As with all forensic evidence, chain of custody is really important. Um, this, the sand or soil evidence would be bagged, identified, sealed, and signed across that seal. Of course, unique soil samples will provide a little bit more helpful evidence. Um, and that evidence can be taken from shoes, clothing, vehicles, uh, and so forth. In examining the soil that is collected, um, it's helpful to look just with the naked eye to notice size, shape, color, um, also the amount of organic matter in there and the particle size. X-ray diffraction is also a really nice tool as demonstrated here where the X-rays will def deflect off of the soil um, in a unique way based on the minerals that are present. And I'd like to say uh, thanks for tuning in. This has been um, a great learning experience.